Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where in the world you might be. And welcome to the Global Health Technology Coalition webinar, a second in a series looking at some critical public health, global health technology issues uh, that are emerging. My name is Mitchell Warren. I'm the executive director of AVAC, an HIV advocacy organization um, that has been a proud member of GHTC from its beginning. Uh, GHTC is a group of about 25 organizations, uh, nonprofits, involved in product development, in policy, in advocacy, and in engagement around accelerating global health technology development and hopefully product introduction as well. Um, you're here today for a webinar that over the next 90 minutes is going to look at a range of issues, particularly around innovation and where they fit in a post-2015 agenda. Hard to believe being sitting here in, in almost May 2015, but we are already looking beyond 2015, and I'm delighted to have four terrific colleagues from very different parts of the global health architecture to explore various issues that we want to talk about with all of you. Uh, it is a webinar uh, feature, and while the five of us are sitting here in New York, uh, we really are looking to engage with all of you uh, through a range of, of media. Uh, there'll be opportunities for you to be asking questions as we go. Um, after each of them speaks for a bit, I will uh, be introducing questions, um, hopefully most of them coming from all of you, uh, and you will see uh, on the web feature of the webinar how to do that. So those questions will get fed in. Um, we'll get to as many as we can over the next 90 minutes, and if we don't get to them all, rest assured there are going to be ways for you to engage with each of them, as well as with GHTC to take this agenda forward. Um, what I'm going to do for the, for the morning then is to introduce each of the four that we have here very, very briefly. You're going to see their whole bios on screen and I'm not going to take too much time in, in going through their long bios, but rest assured they are distinguished, experienced veterans in global health, although on the youthful side of, of things. Um, I will then ask each one um, just a, a brief question um, where they will kick off with some comments um, and then we'll take it from there with a range of questions. Uh, and again, feel free to bring those questions forward as we go. Um, we have then, uh, during the next 90 minutes, four people, and again, as I said, coming from very different quarters of the global health architecture. Um, in just a moment, I'm going to turn over to Jenna Sloten, who comes from the UN Foundation, based here in New York. She's the Deputy Director of the Post-2015 Initiative, so probably the one person with a title uh, that fits this particular webinar better than anyone else. Um, we will then turn to Nick Chapman. Uh, from Policy Cures, based in Australia, um, who's uh, had a great deal of work looking around health financing and health innovation within the post-2015 agenda. We're then going to turn to uh, Genevieve Merkel, who's the policy advisor to the U.S. ambassador here at the U.N. Um, and uh, in the U.S. mission, and is going to look at some of the U.S. government perspectives on the 2015, post-2015 agenda. And then our, our fourth presenter is Willow Brock, who comes from uh, one of the product development partnerships that have emerged over the last 15 years, if we look back in, in global health. Uh, he's the uh, senior uh, vice president of the TB Alliance and oversees their external relations. Um, so coming from a very product-specific, disease-specific area. Um, again, their full bios are online, and, and I hope you will uh, take advantage of those and, and see the kinds of people we have presenting today. Um, so as I say, we're going to start with each having a bit of a, an opportunity to frame some of these issues. And happily, I'm going to start with, with Jenna from the UN Foundation. Um, given, as I say, her title is around the post-2015 uh, initiative, um, uh, Jenna, if you could walk us all through uh, what is this post-2015 uh, effort afoot, maybe looking a bit back at where we've been coming from with the Millennium Development Goals to think about where we go with the Sustainable Development Goals. Great. Thanks, uh, thanks Mitchell. Um, hello to all of you, and thank you so much for joining us today. It's really, really a pleasure to be here um, and to work with all of you. Um, let's see if we can uh, get this go. going properly. There we go. And the next one. There we go. There we go. So the, great, the post-2015 development agenda, here we are. Um, uh, so um, I'll just start with, um, as Mitchell said, a general overview. And, and, and he, he noted that here we are in Maine and we're ar already looking beyond post-2015. In fact, um, this process has been looking beyond 2015 for probably the last three to five years. Um, and um, it's worth noting that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to provide sort of an overview of the process of, um, of defining these goals. So what do we mean by the post-2015 agenda? Um, well, in September, um, global leaders are going to come together at a summit. Um, to agree the next global goals um, uh, for the period from 2015 to 2030. And effectively what this is, is the world's to-do list um, around global development with a focus on ending extreme poverty, um, addressing inequality, and protecting the planet. 
So this to-do list is what we call the post-2015 development agenda. Um, so here on this slide, um, what I have for you are um, what's been agreed by the different countries that are negotiating um, uh, the agenda. And there are going to be four components of the development agenda. One is the declaration, which is going to be the overall vision, um, where we want to get to by 2030. The second is the part that you've probably heard the most about, which is the goals and targets, frequently referred to as the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and that's at building upon, as, as you know, the Millennium Development Goals. The third piece is financing and what's called means of implementation. So that's how this agenda is going to be implemented um, to do with um, really who's going to pay and what are some of the policy steps that have to do with implementation. And lastly, the monitoring and accountability piece. How are we going to follow up, review progress, and ensure that um, all actors are meeting their commitments? So here we are, um, rather complicating slide, but this is where we are in the process. As you can see, we're um, just at the, uh, um, just beyond the first quarter of 2015, and we're coming, um, we're well in the uh, yellow box of General Assembly member state negotiations, and moving very, very quickly into the green bubble um, in the middle on financing for development. Um, so I don't want to dwell on this too heavily, but as you can see, it's a multi-layered process with many different actors and a whole range um, of discussions. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about where we are. Um, the OWG stands for the Open Working Group Outcome Document, and it was actually agreed in July 2014. The first nine goals are on the screen, and I'll flip in a moment to the next um, eight goals. So we have 17 goals and 169 targets. Broadly speaking, we got to this um, through a committee of um, countries, um, UN member states, that were negotiating what this outcome was going to look like. And broadly speaking, although it was a subcommittee, um, it was open to all member states. And in fact, it was very um, member states engaged in a really wide way. They actually they also had very structured interaction with civil society, academia, the business community. So very inclusive process. Um, especially towards the end, the negotiations were very very intense, dealing with a number of very contentious issues. And what they came out with um, was um, uh, what is widely viewed as a very politically balanced outcome that includes, um, that is broad and expansive, but includes many of the challenges that we're looking at for the world to 2030. Um, important to note that initially it was agreed that this would be the basis for the formal intergovernmental negotiations that only kicked off at the beginning of this year. But because that political balance was in fact so delicate, it's really sticking. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, why we are where we are. And it's unlikely that these 17 goals and 169 targets are going to change much between now and September. This is the next set of goals. As you look at this, I'd like to just reflect on um, what I think um, makes this process a little bit different than the MDGs. And there are really three reasons and to my mind, and I'm sure the other panelists will have other views and you at home may have, have other views as well. The first is inclusion. As I highlighted, the process to get to these 17 goals was really broadly inclusive in a way that the MDGs weren't. Um, as many of you probably know, over 5 million people voted on the My World survey to define what their priorities were. There were hundreds of consultations organized in countries and on themes around the world by the UN and by non-governmental actors. There were a range of opportunities for civil society and other stakeholders to feed in, and really every member state Every country in the UN had the opportunity to feed in and make their voices heard. Secondly, this agenda is really um, meant to be transformative. And it's meant to be transformative in two ways that I think are particularly um, worth noting. One relates to inequality, and the second relates to sustainability, both issues that really weren't well addressed in the MDGs. Um, so on inequality, um, what we're really highlighting is that we're now not just focused on growth, but we're focused on inclusive growth and how people are included in the ways in which we grow and develop our societies. And on sustainability, again, it's not just about income growth, but what are the impacts on the environment and the ways in which we grow and develop and ensuring that we really are protecting our planet and our delicate ecosystems as we move forward. And the third way in which it's different is it's universal. 
So the MDGs covered seven goals, which were really about the developing world um, implementing, um, and the eighth goal really had to do with the developed world footing the bill, broadly speaking. Um, that's a bit of an overgeneralization. Now we're talking about 17 goals that really do apply to all countries and all stakeholders. And that um, signals a real change in power imbalances in the world, but it also is a real change, in, signals a real change in how countries are thinking about this both domestically and internationally. So I'd like to just ta um, flag some of the current debates. And what I mean by that are, I'm not touching on you know, what are the most contentious issues in the agenda, whether it's sexual and reproductive health and rights or peace and governance, but what are the real current debates that are um, uh, in the forefront of member states' minds? One is to do with financing and means of implementation. Um, and that's really challenging because it's really about how this agenda is going to be implemented. And this is really where the rubber meets the road. Who's going to pay? What changes are going to be made? And how do we make the financing and means of implementation piece universal? There are also a number of contentious issues with the upcoming Financing for Development Conference and how these two fit together. Broadly speaking, some countries want to see them operate on two tracks, and other countries see the Financing for Development Conference really being integrated in the post-2015 agenda in that means of implementation pillar. So that's an outstanding and challenging question. Secondly, the outlook for the goals, targets, and indicators. As I said, the delicate political balance achieved in that open working group last July means that member states really, um, there's a real challenge around whether um, or if it's possible to refine the goals. And a lot of sensitivity around doing so, lest that balance unravel, or we lose some key issues um, that a lot of uh, member states and other stakeholders fought to get included. On the other hand, as you will have seen in the media and from certain countries, a real push for um, something that's going to be easily understood and communicated by gl to global leaders, but also to ordinary citizens. 17 goals, 169 targets, and a huge number of indicators is frankly um, really, really challenging. And lastly, one of the under-discussed issues and one of the, um, the next really big issue to be addressed in May in the negotiations is the question of what the monitoring, review, and accountability structures and process is going to look like. So a lot of outstanding questions there. Oops. Ah. Oh, no. Ah. Well, we're done. Oh. <laughs> maybe we can, we maybe can someone go back can fix to that. Those, I suspect. Yeah. yeah if you want to pass that this way. That's great. Uh, Jenna, that was fantastic and, a, and an incredibly helpful process to get us back. We're going to get those slides back up here so we can see them. Um, but that was an incredibly uh, rich presentation that really helped me, frankly, understand this better than ever. Um, did you have additional, did we get through? Yep, yeah, we're, um, All there right. we go. And we are, just, I do want to touch on this piece uh, um, about staying updated, both with UN Foundation and with this whole process. And we're going to come back to that at the very end of the day uh, to really talk about how can anyone engage in this ongoing process. Um, but that was um, a terrific overview. We're going to switch now uh, to Nick Chapman uh, from Policy Cures, uh, based in Australia, but working globally. Um, and, and Nick, you know, one of the things that's very striking is, as Jenna presented that is obviously this incredible breadth, uh, 17 goals, 169 targets, and I don't even want to know how many indicators. But um, we really want to talk a, a fair bit today about innovation and, and global health. And so in the midst of all of that rich, robust, we're going to make this world the place we all want to live in, where does innovation fit in, in, in the context of, of global health and R&D in the midst of all of that? Yeah, I, th I mean, and I think that that's a, a really cr well, a, a key question. Um, and to start with, I think probably it's important to s talk a little bit about, I mean, given the breadth and, and, and the you know, sheer scope of the SDGs, uh, how central health is to the achievement of sustainable development. And so I'll just, you know, the MDGs, you know, there were, there were eight targets, three of which were for health. So the SDGs, we've got 17 targets, one of which is for health. And of that sort of to-do list of 169 targets um, that, that uh, Jenna mentioned, the sort of, of the top 19 that were found to have the most bang for your buck, if you will, that, that will deliver the most, um, you know, the, the highest impact for, for every dollar spent, eight of those were in health. Um, and the sort of the, the targets around reducing the, the incidence of, and mortality from TB, from HIV, from malaria, and from mater maternal mortality and 
neonatal and child mortality are really up the top of that list. So, you know, health is, is really central to, to sustainable development achieving the SDGs. And where innovation comes in is that we know that many of those specific targets, um, you know, TB for example, but, but across multiple of those targets, we know that they won't be achieved um, or are extremely likely to be achieved in the time frame that's set out in the SDGs uh, with the tools that we currently have. Um, and, and this is sort of acknowledged in, in many of the key uh, global strategies, the WHO strategies, the, the global technical strategy for malaria, the new strategy around Stop TB Now, they explicitly acknowledge they have the same targets as the SDGs around the elimination of malaria or reduction in TB, and they explicitly acknowledge that these won't be achieved without the new tools. So, you know, achieving the SDGs needs, you know, new drugs, diagnostics, vaccines and other te health technologies and improved knowledge around how to introduce those new tools once they become available and how to use the tools that we currently have better and in what situations, you know, when they should be used and when they shouldn't. And then uh, the reason, I guess, that that there's sort of we need to pay extra attention to this is that this innovation for the diseases that we're talking about won't happen automatically. So the diseases that we're particularly talking about there um, and that will be critical to achieving the SDG goals are diseases or health needs that predominantly affect people in the developing world or, or the burden of disease disproportionately affects um, people in developing countries and so there is no you know profit driver to sort of stimulate um, you know, the private sector to just normally uh, you know, undertake the R&D necessary to develop those tools. And so we're heavily reliant on the public sector, so government investment and philanthropic investment, um, including industry philanthropy, to, to be able to deliver those tools. So I think that sort of the, s the critical centrality of health to the SDGs, the fact that we know that in order to achieve those health goals we need new tools and the fact that, that the those new tools won't be developed automatically is why we need to care about innovation in the SDGs and why there, you know, A, it needs to be sort of recognised as a priority, but also we need to have measures of, of how we're going against that. And so that's where I guess a lot of our focus is in um, with the work that you talked about. And so there's a real risk at the moment of, of the innovation not being adequately reflected in the SDGs. Um, it is mentioned specifically, the R&D for the health needs of developing countries is mentioned in one of those 169 targets. Um, actually, in, in, as part of the sort of robust and vigorous debate that you, you mentioned, it was the, there were two targets, one on the need for R&D and one on the need for access to, to essential medicines that were combined together and put in under the health goal at the last minute. So the target actually confuses, well not confuses, but, but has two distinct elements to it which need different solutions and, and we need to measure progress against those in different ways. And so that's one of the reasons why having um, good, robust uh, and meaningful indicators there are really important. And that's um, where we are looking like we're running into trouble because of the, the sort of key proposals for the monitoring framework that we talked about and what indicators we're going to use. Um, the, the sort of indicators that we use to measure prog progress against for global health R&D are, are really missing. So the UN Statistical Commission did a big survey um, and basically proposed a preliminary list of indicators that it's going to use and didn't propose one for this target at all. The WHO and the rest of the health group have proposed an indicator that only measures the access element of the target. Um, and another group, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, um, is, has proposed one, but as a sort of ad hoc, voluntary, if, if countries want to measure it, they can sort of indicate it. And I mean, as you said before, it's, it's, it's a crowded space and so it's, it's understandable. So, you know, we had Millennium Development Goals, eight goals, three of which were health, 21 targets and 60 indicators. And now we've got 17 goals, 169 targets. Um, but, you know, the, the sort of consensus around what can feasibly be measured by, um, UN, uh, by national statistical officers is, say, between 100 and 120 indicators, which is already double what we're, we're measuring now uh, for the MDGs. But if you looked at the same ratio, um, you know, of indicators to targets, because many of these targets have multiple aims, so that, you know, target 3.3 is TB, HIV, um, 
uh, malaria and other infectious diseases. So, so if you're looking at the same ratio, you, you really, to measure those 169 targets, you'd need 480 indicators. So, um, so we know then that we're going to be heavily reliant on um, well, so, you know, so-called cross-cutting indicators that are able to measure multiple targets. Um, and that many of these targets won't actually be able to be monitored in the, probably in the global monitoring framework. And, and a lot of it will be this sort of left up to countries to monitor if they have the capacity to do so. And so part of what we're looking at is, you know, if, you know, what, I, I, in light of this, the sort of the, the central importance of, of health innovation to achieving the SDGs, but recognising those challenges, you know, what can, you know, what's, what's feasible and what indicators should be incorporated into the, these sort of monitoring efforts. And, you know, looking at what's around globally, what's supported by stakeholders um, and what's feasible. And, you know, both what's out there and what's being currently proposed for the SDGs. You know, there are a lot of indicators that can measure innovation but don't incorporate any sort of measure of global health and a lot of measures for global health but there's no way of measuring innovation. And so, we're trying to find, you know, indicators that, that fill that gap in the middle. Um, and essentially, you know, I'll sort of wrap up now to so we can move on to more discussion. But um, we, wanna, th we want them to be sort of feasible, we want them to be suitable and appropriate, um, and they need to be endorsed. And we need to balance sort of realism, um, but also some, some level of aspiration because, you know, innovation by definition is, is doing something new. Um, and we need to sort of not be entirely constrained by only the things that we've always measured in the past and how we've measured in the past. So, you know, to, to strike a, a good balance for, for identifying a monitoring framework for innovation, we need to look at sort of what do we want to achieve in the SDGs? What is it that we need to do to get there, uh, including things that we haven't developed yet, and, and how are we going to achieve that? Or how are we going to measure progress towards that? Great, Nick, thank you so much. <laughs> and, and an imp important point, I think, at the very end that I, I suspect we will come back to a lot over the next hour, and that is this balance between realism and aspiration. We, do, we don't get to, 2020, to 2030 in a world we want um, without aspiration, but we also don't get that aspiration if we don't balance it with realism. So it was a great point to, to end on. Um, let me turn next, actually, to, to Genevieve Merkel from uh, the UN mission here, or the US mission here in, in New York. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things that I think Jenna said at the very outset that really differentiates the MDGs from the SDGs is this inclusivity, that this is not the, the targets for some countries to be funded by other countries, but targets for the world to achieve together. Obviously, the U.S. government is, is uh, the, the, the proverbial elephant in the room in the sense of uh, funding around development assistance, um, around engaging on a lot of these issues, and, and wonder um, if you could provide a bit of perspective of where um, the U.S. mission is engaged in the process in New York, but also where the U.S. government kind of looks and how it looks at some of these issues that are emerging. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for this. This is a fascinating conversation, and I find that I want to just set all this aside and just respond and get <laughs> a conversation well, already so this is great um, so I think yeah to start that off I um, I think that is exactly actually the balance between realism and ambition is what we've been sort of set on and trying to get towards in some sort of clear sense for the last two and a half years somewhere I suppose potentially approaching five years I guess it's been two and a half years since I've been working on this agenda so I <laughs> just speak for myself um, and I think the hope is that we could kind of get to a place where we had a very clear set, very clear understanding of what an inspirational, affirmative, but very understandable vision would look like. Because I think learning the lessons from the MDGs, we all sort of emerged with the sense that it was its precision and clarity that gave us some sort of a uniting element to sort of get, get behind. So we recognize that that's what we need to achieve, but also recognize that we have to expand that. And we, we see that there were many, many components that were missing. And I think um, Jenna uh, got to this bit when she was talking about the sort of inclusivity of, of the process. I think the inclusivity of the process is partially because that's how you ostensibly make a good process. But I think it's in part also recognizing that in the MDGs, there were enormous gaps, enormous gaps. There was uh, there, it was an incredibly uneven 
sort of achievement of, of what we set out to do. And I think the very um, clear intention this time around, and this has been a motivating force for the U.S. government since we began this, is that that not be the case this time, that we address the sort of range of issues in a comprehensive way, but still sort of a limited way that is understandable. Um, but in the midst of that, we don't ever lose sight of the fact that this has to reach the most vulnerable. This has to reach the bottom quintile in everything that we try and do. So no matter what priorities we set out, we have to set out, uh, set our eye on what will move the needle for that bottom quintile. So with that kind of as a frame, our process, um, which is quite robust and has quite a large number of, uh, of engaged parties in, uh, in Washington, all around, I suppose, which is really actually quite inspiring, and it does go very much to the highest levels. This is, um, you know, this has gotten support um, from very high up within the U.S. government from the very beginning. We have kind of gone about a very, um, a very evidence-based process for figuring out what our priorities are, for saying how do we build on this and and set the, and realize the vision that that I was just talking about. So our general approach has been um, to in looking at priorities to make sure that we're really staying with the unfinished business of the MDGs, um, that we we know that the MDGs set us on a path of remarkable and sustained progress, much of which was in the health space, um, and that we can't we cannot lose that momentum in the specific issue areas, but also sort of in just the approach. But then we also, speaking to what I was, um, what, what I started with, we have to make sure to think through the sort of transformative elements that, um, that w were missing from the last time around. Things like energy and job-rich growth, sort of inclusive growth, as Jenna was saying, um, peace and governance, gender equality and women's empowerment. While there was a goal before, it wasn't focused on the full suite of what we think of when we talk about gender equality. And, you know, environmental sustainability is rather, rather big. Um, I suppose elephant in the global room as well. So <laughs> you know, this is these issues have to be um, have to come together in some sort of cohesive whole. So that's been our intention from the outset. Um, I think as we and we've committed to this process sort of throughout the open working group that came up with these um, 17 goals and 169 targets, and now as we move into the certainly continued conversation on the substance matter, but also into the implementation. I think we are very clearly realizing that. Um, this agenda, and we, we've sort of, I think, all said this many times, this agenda will rise or fall based on the strength of its implementation. And um, so we cannot wait until October of 2015 or January of 2016 or October of 2016 to start really putting the pieces in place to make this, to realize this thing. Because no matter what we do in our negotiation process over the next several months, we, um, we know the overall contours of this and we can move forward because of the experience we've had before. So I think that gets into this conversation we're having today, the question of health innovation, because I think um, very clearly when we talk about what we're going to need to realize this ambitious an agenda, we can, looking at what we're doing, the U.S. government has put enormous amounts of money into health research for years. Um, we have put enormous amounts of, of money and effort and ideas into sort of development and health services. These are fields we've been pursuing um, and continue to find new innovations in. But in order to get to the kind of ambition that we're setting, it will require bending the curve even more. And that, that kind of curve bending cannot come without innovation. I think I mean, everybody watching and here mm -hmm. clearly knows that. Um, and so the question is, how do, we, how do we really codify that? How do you create the atmosphere that, that gets there? And there is a question about whether it's by putting actual words down in targets, or if it's about creating a network of innovators that kind of compels this forward, or both, and a whole number of additional <laughs> ideas. Um, but these are the questions that I think we, we all need to be asking and are asking now. Um, so one of the ways that we're doing that, I'll just give one example, and then um, in, for the sake of, of discussion, we'll, we'll end it there. Um, one of the ways that we're doing this is in uh, this Grand Challenges program. So the idea behind this is that um, you set out a problem that needs to be solved and look for innovative solutions to that problem wherever they may lie and find ways to elevate them and and get them scaled up in, in various ways. So um, there we put we have put 50 million dollars over the first five years into a saving life. This was our first one a saving lives at birth grand challenge. The idea was to sort of look for the um, during the first 48 hour or the 48 hours surrounding birth and technology service delivery and demand for the best ideas we could find. So this got a number of, of applicants, 2,000 applicants from 102 different countries. 
And the idea is that you don't have to be from a big institution to be able to come up with these ideas. One of my favorites in hearing about this one uh, originally was um, this, uh, I may even pronounce it wrong, but Odon. This is the first device for, nope. No, this is, you're <laughs> exactly right. This is my favorite story, right. please. <laughs> um, so the first device for obstructive labor in 40 years, um, invented by an Argentinian car mechanic. And the seed of the idea came apparently from, uh, from a party trick yeah. that he saw. That, and something that turned from that into actually saving lives is sort of what this entire agenda should be about and finding those kinds of ideas and actually bringing them together. And I think this, I'll, I will stop now, but I think this actually gets very clearly into not just the concept of how we implement, but also the concept of how we do the sort of monitoring and review process because that's not just about accountability and making and doing a check, check card to make sure that people are doing what they said they were going to do. It's also about sharing good ideas globally so that we actually have a platform for progress beyond just one place, one one place and a lot of, so I did not say that well, but I mean, connecting well. lots of different places and lots of different ideas. And I think um, one of the reasons it has been so exciting to work on this is because it is so much more than an international negotiation process. It's so much more than the politics of uh, one country's interest versus another. It is so much about the possibility of what's coming. And I think um, it's it's actually very fun to be on this panel because it's given me a window not just into the process but into one piece of that that fits into this bigger whole. So. No, that, that is fantastic. I mean, I'm so glad you brought up the Odin. I, for those uh, who wonder about the party trick, it, it's actually on YouTube and he went to search for it. It was how to get a cork out of a bottle after it had fallen through and out of that became the possibility uh, of um, the first ever device. It's, it's remarkable. Um, and it's actually the great segue to, to, to Willow. So when I look, um, you, you're wondering how that is. Um, when, when I look at the last 10 or 15 years in global health, almost 20 years now, um, one of the, the innovations has been the development of these public-private product development partnerships, of which the TB Alliance is one. Um, and they have worked on vaccines, on new drugs, on new diagnostics. Uh, and, and it really has been a, a new part of the architecture of global health. Um, that said, as we look at this crowded space, as Nick described it, as we see what had been a real focus on global health issues, TB, HIV, ones that you and I both work on, as well as malaria and other infectious diseases, some would argue they're lost in the shuffle. That, um, and we all know we can't get to the SDGs if we don't address those health issues, but if they're not called out, we can't address them fully. So you're on this panel representing an organization focused on, on very specific drug development in one particular disease area. And um, so perhaps perfect segue to figure out, well, where does that innovation fit in? Um, why does the TB Alliance care? Um, and, and how can the SDGs advance the TB d drug development agenda? And how can the TB drug development agenda advance the SDGs? So a simple question. <laughs> a simple question. Um, it might take a minute or so to expand on that. Um, thank you, and thank you for inviting me. This is very, it's very exciting, and I think it's very interesting from the perspective of a product development partnership to be here and explain how such a, let's say, small piece of the puzzle actually has a place, I think. And um, just to start off with that is maybe to say that the TB Alliance was started in 2000 when the MDGs really started. Um, and the founders of the organization at that time realized that without any new tools, without new drugs, there wasn't going to be uh, the possibility to achieve the TB goals that had been set at the time. Um, also, I think it was um, important that those founders already had the sort of insight that um, working together in partnerships is what helps to get out of the clutter. Um, so in 15 years of time, uh, innovation is a long-term game to play. We have actually been able to develop the largest pipeline of uh, new potential drugs for TB treatment in the world today. Um, also in that time, I think we have managed to become part of a network of very credible um, international organizations that deal with this issue. And I think that's both important elements of, of, um, of, the, of, the, st of the story here. Um, the reason we are interested in the SDGs, first of all, I think, uh, just like the first round, the, uh, the Millennium Development Goals, the Sustainable Development Goals are going to be what everyone focuses on. So in many ways, if it's not part of the Sustainable Development Goals, to be fair, it will very likely not happen at any scale. 
So if you're an organization that's involved in international development, in issues of equality, in issues of basically where do we want to live in 15 years from now, what sort of world, then you have to engage with the sustainable development goals, whether you like it or not. Um, and I like it. Um, when we looked at those sustainable development goals, I think what happened this time, which might be slightly different from the process of the negotiating the first round of Millennium Development Goals, is for instance for TB to make it really more concrete, and I'll talk with some of the sort of larger, more politically biased words that I used in this process, is basically to say everyone in the world has the right to the same quality of treatment and the same health outcome, no matter where you live. So this is an idea that's sort of dubbed this sort of dubbed this convergence, which we definitely are very much behind. Whether you are here in the US, whether you're in Europe and Japan, or whether you are in Lesotho, you have the same right to the same quality outcome in health. Now, if you look at the numbers and then decide that your target is going to be based on that, you see that you need to define a 95% reduction in the mortality rate of TB to be able to get there you need to get to a 90% reduction in incidence. And these are mainly people that live in low and middle income countries. And TB is the quintessential disease of poverty in that sense. So in order to reach those type of goals, in order to be able to reduce that amount of incidence, we simply need a dramatic change in the way that treatment works today. Um, we have seen quite a lot of progress in the, f in the first 15 years. We see about a 2% reduction in TB incidence around the world. But that will never be enough to get us to where we want to be if we set ourselves that goal of global convergence of having the right to the same health uh, outcome wherever you are in the world um, without innovation. Now, of course, as an organization that's set up with a single goal of innovation, <laughs> it won't be strange to say that I'm very passionate <laughs> about that, but we, uh, and that we need to ensure that commitment to innovation. So I think the world has done a whole lot of good and learned a lot in the first 15 years to be able to set a goal that's really ambitious and that is really logical, and that I think a lot of people will stand behind. What we see is that maybe research and innovation has been a little bit neglected in that process, that role. And again, when that is not included in the process, whether there are 169 targets, whether we need to measure 480 indicators or 481, it is important to make that point. Um, just to get a little bit more practical, I want to show you uh, two pictures to, to talk to you about what today's treatment looks like and to give an idea what innovation actually means for real people. So this first picture is a lady in South Africa that is crushing an adult TB pill in order to get to a, a dosage that is, uh, that is actually the right dosage for her child. There are, believe it or not, no current treatments that a child can get that is properly dosed and that can be taken as it is. Um, we've been working with a number of partners and from this, uh, from this June onwards we will have a, d a dissolvable um, uh, drug that can be taken with a glass of water by a child that will taste well enough for the <laughs> child to take it. <laughs> but just imagine, to have to do this, to have to guess whether you're giving your child the right treatment, whether you're giving your child the right dosage, not too much, not too little, and doing this multiple times a day for six months. This is just drug sensitive TB in real life. Um, innovation means that this lady will just dissolve a tablet in a glass of water, give it to the child, and be able to treat well. Now, this is already a big breakthrough. But adult treatment, even though there are pills that are the right dosage, are still very complex to administer. Four months in an initial phase and a two-month follow-up phase. Six months of treatment required. Four different drugs treated. When, depending on your weight and size, the doctor might have to adjust your dosing to be able to give you the right level of dosing. So this is complex. So in order for people to be going through this process to adhere to six months of, of treatment, is very, is very hard as an individual. If you don't, you might relapse, you might get the disease back, and even worse, you might get the disease back with a drug-resistant strain. Mm -hmm. In that case, you'll be looking at 18 to 24 months of treatment. I'll come back to that in a second. It is not just about these people. It's also, in order to make that progress that I discussed, it's sort of 2% progress a year, we've actually gotten an army of people around the world into the field to monitor each individual patient to stay on treatment to make sure that they don't stop that treatment because they feel slightly better or because it's too expensive or whatever it is. Um, that army of people 
um, could be relieved. The health system pressure that we currently create because of the current day treatment will be relieved. And then finally, these, um, these patients, uh, we've done studies that show that over 75% of people that get TB, whether drug sensitive or drug resistant, will at some point stop their productive economic activities. So what happens is not just that you get sick. If the disease doesn't get you, poverty will. Mm. So it exacerbates the cycle of poverty. So it's not just that this innovation will mean better treatment and, and being healthier. It also means your life can continue um, as, as it is. Um, just look at the second picture, if I can get it up. Yes, here we are. This, I think, is a shocking picture. This is the number of pills a child who has HIV and is uh, co-infected with drug-resistant TB has to take every day for 24 months, potentially, and at least 18 months. This is what treatment looks like in, around the world. And this is, a, this is probably a lucky child. This child actually gets the treatment. Mm -hmm. So just thinking about having to do this, just having to be a doctor, mm -hmm. just prescribe this, monitor this, is just impossible. Mm -hmm. um, and co-infection happens in about one third of the TB cases. So this is not just an odd one out. This is not me being a TB specialist, which I'm not anyway. Um, but this is happening to a large number of people. Nine million people get TB every year. Half a million of those develop a drug resistance strain. Um, some from non-adherence and recovery, uh, getting the, the disease back, but more and more people from just directly uh, contracting drug resistant TB in the first place. So. These are just two people with a very complex treatment. Now imagine that nine million times. Now imagine what that does to the, to the health system. So if you could get a treatment that we currently see as a possibility in our research of about six weeks, and maybe a treatment of two weeks, which is our vision, but which is further out, but how much difference that would make if you would have a single pill that is not weight adjusted, that can be uh, administered easily with HIV uh, ARVs, that can be, that be, can, that be can given for just six weeks and for six months, what difference that makes in people's lives. So we believe that that's the reason why innovation is so important and needs a solid commitment mm -hmm. in the agenda of the SDGs. Um, it will help us get there, it will get us improve healthcare, it will reduce poverty. So I think that's probably for us so the essential point mm -hmm. of innovation in real life with real patients. No, that's, that's terrific, Willow. And, and it's, it, it really, you know, I, I think all of these presentations were remarkable. I think these two photographs um, really, for me, highlight the, the, the essential need for innovation and the reality of people's lives. We can get lost in numbers, whether it's 169 targets or 9 million people with TB or 35 million people with HIV. But when you see two photos like that, it, it, it really gives us um, the, the real sense of why this is all so important. There are a, a terrific number of questions that are coming in, um, and, and I'm going to do my best to, to navigate through them in some logical order, but, but forgive me. Um, uh, and, and I want to encourage everyone to keep those questions coming. We will get to them hopefully in the next uh, 45 minutes or so, and even afterwards there's going to be plenty of opportunity for this process to continue. Um, you know, a, a number of things came up that, that focus around um, what next. So let's assume the negotiations are done, that we have these SDGs and we, they are what they are. So around implementation, um, I, I wanted to ask a couple of things. And, and one, and, and this is really for all of you, um, as we think about implementation, um, you know, one of the realities of target setting is the, a good target uh, is something that's measurable, obviously, something that's actionable, even if aspirational, but it has to have resources to it. And I'm wondering in the context of setting this whole process up in thinking about implementation, has this, to do all of this, has it been costed? Is there a budget uh, number that I know would knock anybody off their chair, but better to know it than not know it? So has it been done? Um, and, and if not, I guess why not? I mean, do we know how much this would cost to achieve all of this? Me, um, Jenna. Maybe I'll try to pitch in some thoughts. Please. Um, I'm not sure I can answer the question. No problem. So alongside the open working group, there was a group of finance experts. It was um, another sort of subcommittee in this whole process. Um, and they were meant to be looking at um, these really challenging financing questions. Um, and they didn't go so far as to cost. You could imagine for a whole range of reasons, um, it's incredibly difficult to cost, particularly in thinking about innovation, right? If things change five years down the road, 10 years down the road, that may reduce costs, it may increase costs. There are a whole, whole, whole bunch of reasons 
reasons why it's a challenge. Nonetheless, in their report, they gave some rough orders of magnitude. Um, I unfortunately, because that report was published um, back in August, I can't recall what they are, but I'm happy to, you know, the, the, the link to their report is on the UN's Sustainable Development website. Um, but the other point I'd flag is that I think in thinking about costing, it's important not just to think about numbers, um, but to think about different flows. And I don't want to sound too esoteric, but one naturally because of the MDG era thinks, how much is this going to cost in aid? How much money are donors going to spend? When actually the types of things we're talking about, the universal agenda, the nature of innovation, means that a whole range of players and different types of financing need to come into play. So it's not all about hard cash, actually. There are different, um, first of all, it's about um, aid as well as the monies that governments raise domestically through taxes. And that, it, when you budget that out, is actually very different. It's about um, the ways in which countries' debt may be relieved to free up money. Mm. It's the ways in which the private sector may come together with the public sector to combine aid and investment. Um, it's the ways in which loans may be given. And so that it's not all about cash flows. And so, um, and particularly when it um, when we think about experimentation and innovation, I think we're th we, we also are thinking about ways in which money can be saved and we can be more efficient mm -hmm. and be spending money in better ways. And so um, I just wanted to put that in the mix because I think it, you're less likely to fall off your chair <laughs> once you begin to think about all the different pieces that come into play for the costing. No, that's a, a great point. Ooh, mm -hmm. The only thing I would add to that is I think less likely to fall off your chair and less likely to give up because I think that, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I actually genuinely say that because I do think I have also looked at those those reports where you look at it and you say, well, why are we even doing this then? Because yeah. everything that's in here, if you're going to have universal access to education and universal access to healthcare and universal access to an enormous number of other things, 169 <laughs> other things, you have... Um, you know, it, you really do get to a place where you say, well, why are we doing this? Can we do any of this? But I think, um, so I think that the sort of just costing out each goal model um, kind of gets you to a place of um, almost stasis yeah. or, or uh, and I think that um, where we have found kind of the most possibility is when we think, when we look for, at where we are now and what we can catalyze to actually yeah. make the most change now that will hopefully then spin out to do much more. Because even when we look at the lessons of where we were at the start of the MDGs, there were many things about measurement and funding that we didn't yet know about Absolutely. pooling money and partnerships and these sorts of things. So the hope is that we are setting out a pathway that will actually get us to some sort of success. So. Yeah. Absolutely, uh, Nick, and then Willow. Yeah. No, no, this is true. <laughs> no, well, I mean, first, well, first, I, I, I do recall seeing a, a paper or an article somewhere that uh, around costing of the monitoring um, that said that you know, for the indicators currently being proposed, the cost of actually doing that monitoring would outweigh the cost of implementing the sort of programs to achieve the goals by more than tenfold, or, or something, something you know, crazy like that. I can't recall where that was. Um, but the, to sort of, just to pick up on what Willow was talking about before about this convergence um, in global health and to tie it into to what Jenna was saying about um, where the investment comes from. It's not, you know, we're not talking about necessarily about aid. Um, that, you know, the, the Lancet Commission on Investing in Health um, who did this big paper about what would be required for this um, global convergence, you know, highlighted the, the importance of, um, you know, investing in innovation to achieve that. But specifically highlighted the fact that that needed to be sort of a broad-based sort of I increase in all countries' investment in sort of the research and, and innovation required to achieve that. And it's not um, just saying, you know, oh, the U.S. needs to be funding more. Because, I mean, the U.S. provides about, you know, two-thirds of global funding in this area of, of public funding, um, you know, through the grand challenges and things like that. Yeah, that's a great point. Willa? Um, yeah, just to be very practical, um, we know it might be a billion dollar to get a six-week treatment on, on the market. This is what the pharmaceutical industry spends on every single drug that comes out, and there's mm. hundreds a year that come out. So those type of resources exist. It sounds like 
massive numbers. It's also not new m new money. There is currently investment going on in the development goals. And um, I think which is a really good point, if you look, for instance, in the in the field of TB, the, the, the sort of new middle income countries, the BRICS, uh, yeah. Brazil, South Africa, uh, India, China, they've all made massive commitments because they actually see this problem being one that strikes them most. And, the, and they're willing to invest in that sort of work. So it, it's something that I believe is doable. And then on the other side, as you mentioned, I, I clearly remember, not that young anymore, <laughs> that when the, when the Millennium Development Goal started, everyone was talking about how are we ever going to do this? Mm -hmm. Why are we setting ourselves a goal and we don't have this means of implementation? And I do think it gets a little bit too much attention in this process in the sense that I believe if the world sets itself a target in those 15 years, we've seen that with the Millennium Development Goals, mm -hmm. implementation will to some extent follow, maybe yeah. not to the 100% target that we that we aspire to. But if we get like this time to 90%, I think we all are in a very good place. Mm -hmm. So we need to be aspirational. We do have the numbers. I think if you drill down to each of these individual goals for mm -hmm. TB treatment and for TB innovation, there is a number. We have collectively, with mm -hmm. the help of the WHO, been able to assess how much money that needs. Yes, these are big numbers. We're talking about billions for treatment. We're talking about probably you know, a billion and a half for for drugs, for, for vaccine mm -hmm. research, for, for, for new diagnostics. But these are not numbers on the global scale of work that are actually so far from reality that mm -hmm. we should be frightened. Yeah. And it's a great point about innovation. We, we often think, particularly in, in global health technologies, the innovation is the new vaccine, the new diagnostic, or the new drug. But in fact, I think this issue of funding flows is so interesting. I know Policy Cures runs the G Finder Global Resource Tracking, and at AVAC we manage a, a, an HIV-specific uh, prevention uh, uh, research tracking process. And I know in both cases, seeing the, the evolving contributions from uh, countries that were not previously investing in R&D. So when we look, for example, at AIDS prevention research, um, the investments coming from South Africa, much smaller than the U.S. National Institutes of Health for, for every reason we know, mm -hmm. but investments nonetheless. And even in countries without um, significant financial investments, the contribution through the health system that is supporting clinical trials is something that we're beginning to track. So I think this issue of innovation and financing and thinking differently than, than aid um, only is, is a really important piece. Um, I want to also touch a bit on the, this issue of, of implementation in the sense of, you know, this will go through a process, and I think, Jenny, you had the slide that showed the various moving parts of the process. Once it's codified, once it's done and, and everyone says, yes, this is the world we want, and these are our targets, is there an implementation vision of uh, particularly helping countries develop the policies that would support it. I can imagine some countries, and I think Genevieve, you've certainly presented a, a USG perspective that says, wow, you get this. Um, other countries, and even within the US, other, other groups within the government may not be so interested. So is there a mechanism that's being considered of how to help guide countries to make the policies to support the implementation towards um, these various goals and targets? Uh, it's really an open to, to anyone. I'm happy Genevieve? to take a, a first crack. So actually we had um, at I think it was the March session of the of the intergovernmental process. Um, we had a panel actually that was sort of different from all the other panels because it wasn't actually about leading to something in the outcome document, and it wasn't. Mm. It was just focusing on listening to implementers and people coming in and talking about what they're already doing to build this into uh, build this it hasn't even been agreed yet, but build already what's down mm. into national development plans and. This is all countries. This, uh, there's somebody from the Netherlands on the, plan, uh, on the panel, as well as uh, somebody from Colombia. And so you really are seeing a mobilization that's already in effect that I think takes that question that you're raising mm. extremely seriously and says, how are we going to do this ourselves to make sure that the things that we've already set out as priorities for our country going forward, that this, is, this feeds into them and that, uh, and that we're sort of... Um, driving progress in a way that actually is consistent with this mm. sort of bigger conversation that we're having. So that was actually, I found that to be extremely hopeful because I think you really do, even, even uh, with an attempt to remain hopeful, you get into the, you get mired <laughs> in the details of it, you know, but, um, but seeing this, seeing this action on the ground already to start to change these things at a national policy level was, I think, I think really inspirational for sort of where we're heading. As far as, I mean, there are still very real needs, and I think you're sure. pointing to them. Um, and part of the, the conversation that's going to happen in Addis in July around the Financing for Development Conference is it's actually much bigger than financing streams. It actually talks about things like sort of 
policy, what you need in a policy environment, an enabling environment for innovation, mm -hmm. for um, for actually making these kinds of changes, for changing tax law, for all of this. So um, the concept of what the policy environment will be to enable the rest of this is very a very active part of this discussion, mm -hmm. and and really in every arena. But I think as with any of these things. What's down on paper is only a really small window into what's actually necessary to achieve the remainder of this. So even where you have a policy uh, sort of enabling environment goal, it's one small piece of what so many groups are sort of already act, act doing and mobilizing around. And so sort of continuing to find ways, again, to sort of share those ideas, I think is just going to be absolutely fundamental to the actual achievement of this stuff. Yeah. So speaking of uh, uh, sort of things other than money and things that are sort of under development and under discussion currently. Um, either of you guys have sort of uh, an insight into the discussions recently around the technology transfer um, and sort of how that fits into post-2015 and financing yeah. for development? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, it, I mean, this is a very, it's a very active discussion and interestingly, one that I think um, is very important to marry what's happening in capitals with what's happening in New York. Sometimes these conversations are so mm. stunningly disconnected yeah. and I think the only way we actually get to sort of a good outcome is if we find ways to match them. I mean, this gets to the implementation question and it clearly gets to the technology question because where these innovations ha are happening is not in the in a basement in New York, it's <laughs> obviously elsewhere. Um, so I think we are sort of all in a process of trying to bring that together. I think we very much are sort of bringing our um, the the interesting work to build up sort of national academies in in developing countries and that sort of thing into this sort of into this space. But I think the nature of the actual where it's going to land in the negotiation, I think, remains a bit outstanding. So there is definitely going to be a conversation about technology, science and technology in the financing for development conversation because it really is about that whole sort of comprehensive suite of tools to enable development. Yeah. Um, but I think it is very likely in the way that it has been playing out is that we will continue to have this sort of conversation about in the means of implementation for post-2015 space as well and how specifically that works out gets into a world of details that probably are not <laughs> meant for this conversation, but, but would be worth sort of continuing to talk about. Because I think fundamentally those conversations probably the most need tangible ideas mm -hmm. for how to, how to act and move forward collectively. And I think it's going to require a lot of set setting aside politics to kind of get at what the actual intention is. So. So, oh, <laughs> Jenny, did you want to add something? There? I was going to just sort of pitch in another dimension um, and probably some things that Genevieve can't say <laughs> <laughs> on the technology um, facilitation or technology transfer discussion, which is which is pretty contentious. Um, and broadly speaking, you know, a set of developing countries wanting it to go one mm -hmm. way and developed countries sure. um, seeing opportunities for it to go in other ways. Um, but I'd underline uh, that... Uh, one of the challenges in the discussion right now, and this is, I think, what Genevieve was alluding to about other ideas coming into the discussions, and frankly, quite quickly, so that we can get somewhere that moves beyond politics, is in fact, we're, uh, we're talking about uh, a world of innovation where so many other players that are not in government yes. need to yeah, be yeah. pitching in, right? Exactly. Where does innovation really, you know, often come from? Um, it's in business. I mean, uh, uh, Willow flagged um, private sector pharmaceutical companies innovating in, in treatments and, and, and what role, what can they bring to the table while bearing in mind the interests and needs that they have in terms of their um, business motivations, um, uh, academia and research, um, how do you create an enabling environment for research, um, uh, uh, what can governments do, but what are governments not meant to do or not best placed to do. Um, and and. To be honest, if as an outsider looking into the political discussions, they're a little overly black and white on this question. Um, and, and probably um, m you on the panel have a, have a lot of ideas and the communities that you work with have ideas that could be usefully fed in. I think that's critical. I was going to actually turn, turn to Willow because I think that we, we so often think about these processes, and perhaps it's because we are sitting in New York talking about a UN process, but <laughs> it becomes very governmentally focused, and, and yeah. your observation innovation has to come inevitably from, from outside government. So, uh, Willow, did you want to add a particular thing yeah, about no, industry? I was, I was obviously, yeah, this is, this is a, a big point, and I think, um, as I mentioned, the farm industry has left TB by and large, and some notable exceptions, but this has happened. We have academic 
uh, academia that are doing very good work in sort of better understanding the disease. And this is not just happening in TB. This happens in malaria and leishmaniasis and Chagas. But what this process requires is that pieces of the puzzle get put together. It's not anyone individually that can do this. And this is where this whole concept of product development partnerships was, was designed, not just to create a new entity that was going to do it all, but basically say, okay, so what can we take from the academia? And what can we leverage from the pharma industry? What does government mm -hmm. enable us to do in terms of uh, regulatory policy in terms of um, innovation promotion, as it were, um, and where does the nonprofit industry need to come in to make this sort of lack of financial incentives um, and just fill that space that's created b by that. So I think that's an essential part, and I, I suspect, and I believe in other areas that have been involved in, that this is not just in health, but this is in, in, in all these, these different processes. Mm -hmm. So we need to not look at one individual actor and say, what are they going to do, but have groups work together to further those goals. Um, and, then, and, then, and then work out what's an efficient process for that. And those are hard to solve because this is not what we classically done. You know, it, it's interesting, you, you talked, I think, rightly about the fact that it's no one actor and, and it's obviously much the, the, the analogy of the orchestra, uh, but, but a well-run orchestra has to have a conductor. Mm -hmm. So I want to turn a bit to leadership and accountability. And, and, and piece of that, too, is we talk a lot about government, we talk about private sector, but, but civil society. And I know, Jenny, you mentioned five million people engaged in a survey, but, which is terrific. I mean, that's a remarkable process. But how do we keep civil society engaged? Uh, where do they turn? Who... Who do they hold accountable uh, when things don't happen at the national, subnational, or global level? Um, so it's that issue of both accountability and leadership. So I, I, I realize that's a couple of questions folded together, but I, I'm, I'm happy to have anyone take a, a piece of that, uh, uh, particularly first maybe with civil society. How do they fit in, not, not just in the next six months while this all gets worked out, but for the next 15 years? My my sense of it is that the, the first locus for that needs to be at the national level. It's on a country by country basis. Mm -hmm. Civil society being engaged in holding their own government accountable um, at the national level, certainly, and at the local, uh, further decentralized as much as possible. Um, certainly, major cities are big players um, in the sustainability um, agenda. Um, and that's about, and that's one of the reasons why the inclusivity of the process has been so key because it sets up further civil society engagement. It creates awareness, it creates an opportunity to um, feed in and therefore have buy-in and have and be engaged on an ongoing basis. I and mean, I think that's one of the things that's going to be also different um, about the monitoring this, this um, time around. Um, governments won't just be responding when they show up in New York every two years or five years but rather to their own people, um, hopefully um, on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis. Um, and there are a lot of efforts underway to your question about how to engage civil society um, by major um, global and local campaigning groups to get a, a, a much broader um, swath of citizens, community groups, civil society engaged, mm -hmm. not, uh, not, even, not only in the process right now, but to set up that engagement for the next 15 years. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of work, um, particularly in the lead up to the summit and will be um, in the 72 hours immediately after <laughs> the goals are agreed and in the ensuing three months to ensure that there is a real wide understanding um, of the goals. And that doesn't mean that every individual has to understand every target, mm -hmm. but rather a recognition that the leaders have signed up this is about opportunities for people mm -hmm. um, and that they have a right and an opportunity to hold their governments accountable. So there's a lot of effort underway to engage and, and, and um, the hope is that it's certainly a much larger slice um, of the global population that's engaged this time around. I think that that's really important, and I, th I think about this though in terms of, of what's the the architecture uh, or mechanisms to support that, and and you know I, I wonder how many people really outside of of our bubbles are aware that this process is underway. Um, how many of them are frankly aware that the MDGs existed for the past 15 years, and and um, so I, I wonder if there is an issue. So I think it does come then maybe to this issue of leadership. So. Um, who, who's not so much in charge of the negotiating process, but, but who owns this um, uh, from 20, so post 2015, who owns this? So, oh, no, go ahead. I think we all do. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the essence of the Sustainable Development Goals. The Sustainable Development Goals to me, and why I'm so excited about it, is that it sets this really ambitious global agenda, not just for a couple of issues that have to do with poor, poor people in poor countries. Mm. This is going to be just as challenging for the US or Europe to deal with the sustainability issue as it is with Swaziland to deal with the TB issue. Mm. This is, I think, what is essential about it. And what I think, just going then one step closer, is we talk a lot about um, trajectories and about frameworks and about innovation. You know, I almost fall asleep, to be <laughs> honest, when, when, when that goes on too long. Um, but when I look at these people, when I, when I go to a township and I see people having a new job, that's what the Sustainable Development Goals are about. And I think it's the goal for people that are engaged in it to talk about this in that respect. And I think there's a lot of people that see a lot of news. I do think many people know mm. about the Millennium Development Goals, but a lot of it is about poverty reduction. That was a single goal and that will, in my view, probably ref remain the single goal that people will look at and everything follows all automatically from that. So you can start trying to get yourself a niche in there and if you're really big, you might be able to, you know, if you're a big global charity or a government to focus in on one it item. But for most of us, we will have to make this goal and saying, mm -hmm. we're doing this because it's part of this global ideal that we have. Mm -hmm. And I think that's in essence uh, what we need to do. So we need to talk about TB, health, poverty, mm -hmm. and say this is part, it's part of the agenda and not say we're important on our own. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's Maybe it's point. worth adding that there's a global campaign underway specifically called Action 2015 that's about helping people understand what this is all about and engaging them. So it's not just um, uh, the words like sustainable development goals, which frankly don't communicate very much to anyone. Um, but, you know, for example, when they launched the campaign on January 15th and had actions in 60, 70 countries, they were taking actions with global leaders and 15-year-olds. So, for example, in India, they had actions in 15 provinces of India in 150 cities or municipalities with 15-year-olds engaging leaders at those levels of government. They have 15-year-olds sitting with the UN Secretary General. Mm -hmm. That so. Um, the um, uh, the notion that it's for everyone and particularly for the next generation um, and really engaging all over the world um, in, in a big big way. It's a great point, and, and it's great about 15-year-olds, very, very uh, clever and catchy and a, and a great campaign. That's why so they still know everything, right? They, they, <laughs> they, they, they know what to do. So let's, let's think about this. You're a 15-year-old in 2015, and, and this will run its course, um, and they'll be 30, uh, my, my quick math, in, in 2030. Um, we know, aspirationally, some goals, and I'd love to hear from each of you, what, what does 2020 look like? And, and I say that because so often these, these aspirational goals get put out and we um, kind of embrace them on one level, but then we kind of get up to the point of, of saying, did we achieve it almost too late to make any course corrections? Ideally, you want to know by 2017 if we're even on the right track, um, the right trajectory. So what's 2020 look like for a 15-year-old today that's different? And where does innovation fit into their lives? So what, what would be something that you would look to as yeah, we did some good things in 2015 and we might be on the right track for 2030. So what are you going to look to when we come together for a GHTC webinar in, in April 2020? Um, what would be success by that point? Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, a, it's a huge question. And so, I mean, so many different elements that you could focus on. And perhaps, I'm, well, I might have specifics in the mm. field of TV. But I mean, in general, what, I mean, what we talked about before is um, you know, broadening the base of that um, sort of domestic investment in um, in innovation, so that it's not so sort of you know the bell, the sort of curve doesn't go like that with the US up one end and, and going down, where you've got much more um, investment from you know in proportion to com countries you know capacity to invest in that, but but that it looks different to how it looks today. That's um, a great example, like a really practical thing. That's measurable, and that would tell us that hey, the, the world has an innovation in terms of how we're financing this response. Other thoughts, Willa? I mean, this is where it becomes easier if you're more practical, right? So in TB, <laughs> what, w what we would see is a significant ramp up of that decline of 2% of a year uh, of reduction in incidence a year. So I would say that probably, and I don't know the numbers exactly, but the World Health Organization did this trajectory and actually measured this out. They have a very practical pathway to come to that 90% mm. reduction in incidence. You know, in, in TB 
treatment and innovation, what we will see is a new treatment that is probably two months shorter than the current six months treatment that will be available to all mm. drug sensitive patients and a part of the drug resistant population. There will be an outline of a regimen that will treat all patients mm -hmm. in the same way with one single treatment that is easy to administer and mm. that is going to be a lot cheaper for the health system to, to implement. The current drugs that are going to be available for children will be implemented by that time. So children will be found, mm. will be diagnosed, will be treated, and we'll see a serious reduction in, its, uh, in the negative outcomes of, of the current TB treatment. So very practically, that's what five years from, uh, mm. for, for me looks like. And then 10 years looks even more am ambitious mm. and interesting. And in 15 years from now, um, we'll be very close to solving mm. this problem if we, if we all stay behind this agenda. That's a, it's a great point, I think really an important one too, to say that you know, even if it's not one of the 169 targets, um, you know, what you just outlined in terms of what 2020 looks like from a TB perspective seems to be just as relevant and, and important in terms of tracking innovation towards achievement in 2030. So perhaps a mechanism separate or, or, or additive to the existing yeah, goals yeah. and targets because those are really important. Genevieve. Yeah, I mean, I think it's so helpful to hear actual practical <laughs> things because, you know, we're not talking just in, in theoretical terms. But I do think that captures exactly the kind of momentum that we're going to be looking for in all arenas mm. in five years. That what you're doing is trying to find ways to capture, capture and understand the momentum that's underway. Because it's, we are designing this whole thing to be iterative. I think we, need, we know, and I think this happened during the MDGs, that you look around and you say, actually, what we thought we brilliantly crafted wasn't enough or wasn't the right wasn't the right mm. exact formulation i think the having missed some employment statistics and those sorts of things early on was a problem for some of the sure. poverty trajectories so um i think we um we need to be in a place where we know how to ask that question how do, we know how to look at this kind of trajectory that you laid out and then also acknowledge where there are mistakes and where we're not on on a path mm. and i think the only way we get there is we will have a conversation next month about sort of how to create sort of formal mechanisms for understanding these this kind of monitoring scheme but i really do think that we cannot do this if they're only formal mechanisms and and we cannot do this if it's only sort of even at the national government level we have to find a way to sort of create a platform by which we can understand this at all levels and i don't honestly know where that's going to come from right now and maybe it means that in five years we know that we have it we know that somebody who is mm. more technolo technologically savvy than i has come up with a global platform by which we can all feed in and understand what it looks like to have progress and i think maybe we'll get there before five years from now but i think sure. if we don't get there it's going to be a lot harder to know that's where really we are on the rest of this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it's very striking, you know, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there, but it may take right. you a very long time to get yeah. there. And, <laughs> and it does seem yeah. that having some, some clear demarcations of what would success look like, uh, whether it's disease specific, whether it's um, discipline specific, or even regionally or country specific would be really helpful. Jenna, were you gonna add something? Yeah, just at the risk of being a little more conceptual than um, <laughs> the great concrete <laughs> examples, I think one of the things that we wanna bake into this is the concept of doing business differently mm -hmm. across the whole range of sort of sectors and yeah. that we're talking about and players um, uh, that we're talking about or actors. <coughs> um, because as we've said, you know, sort of <coughs> since we started the webinar, business is usually is just not going to cut it. We're, we're talking about bending a curve and this is where innovation comes in. So that means that the United Nations has to do business differently to support sure. governments. Governments need to do business differently to support their people. Mm -hmm. um, business needs to engage differently. Mm -hmm. um, and um, one of the questions that um, I feel like every key player should be asking itself um, today and really in the immediate aftermath of the, of the summit is what am I going to do differently on January 2016? And we need a mechanism that asks whether we have set our ourselves, at least in the first five years, on the path to do business differently. So we might not see all those results um, coming to fruition in the first 20 years, but are we starting to do business differently in considering, you know, sustainability concerns, how health and poverty impacts come together, how, et cetera, et cetera. So. And I, I just want to say, I don't think that was too conceptual at all. It, it strikes <laughs> me that kind of the, 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 the different index, um, for lack of a better term, is exactly what is, is what I would think as, a, as an advocate in civil society is an, is an account index. If, if people, whether they're an industry, uh, in, in pharmaceutical, whether it is uh, the private sector in, in other domains, the public sector, um, what are you going to do differently? And, and if you can't articulate that, it strikes me that we, by definition, will fail.
um, <coughs> because it is very clear to me that 2030 and the world that, that even comes close to those targets is not possible mm -hmm. um, if we continue along the same path. Um, I, I want to also just pick up on something Nick you said, um, because it strikes me as there's two additional pieces of kind of equity. Um, one is the more equitable sourcing of, of investment in this larger space. So it's not just coming from the um, development assistance uh, arena. But the other is thinking about this bridge between product development and product uh, distribution and product introduction. So I, uh, I come from the HIV world and, and uh, one of the most exciting innovations has been known to us now for almost four, almost five years um, in oral pre-exposure prophylaxis, this idea of a pill a day preventing HIV. And we now have incredibly robust evidence funded by the US NIH, the US Agency for International Development and the Gates Foundation that have demonstrated this. So for me, in by 2020, if this still becomes an intervention that is largely uptaken in the US because no one thinks how to deliver it in um, the high burden countries, we have failed. Mm -hmm. And it really raises the question, why invest in innovation in R&D if you're not willing to invest in the next wave of product introduction? So I think there might be some indicators separate from the kinds of, of UN targeting processes that look at equity and, and doing business and, and doing work differently that might be in incredibly important. So I, I wonder then too, are there things, and maybe Genevieve, particularly for you uh, it, it, from, from the US government perspective, thinking about innovation and, and leadership, are there mechanisms, given that, you know, frankly, R&D and innovation are not you know, high profile issues in the SDGs, we, that, that, and that is what it is. But are there things that you've described here that in addition to feeling passionately as you do and have conveyed, are there things that, that you and colleagues within the US government can help do to raise that in, in venues so that people recognize that? Because I, I don't hear that in the discourse generally. That's it. I mean, it's, actu it's an excellent question. And I think we've been, uh, this innovation in, in general has been an incredibly important priority for this government for the last, certainly the last seven years, but <laughs> many, many years before that. Um, and I think uh, figuring out a way to sort of bring that into this discussion in a, um, explicitly is something we've very actively been talking about. So the goal and target conversation being where it is right now, um, I think our focus has a lot been on this concept of thinking about innovation both in the um, in the implementation space by creating this sort of, uh, you know, creating platforms by which it's the stuff we've been talking about this whole time by which we're actually demonstrating something. But I actually think that we shouldn't overlook the importance of this in the political declaration. I think that, that the political declaration can be an incredibly powerful tool mm -hmm. for communicating what this entire, what this conversation is about and what the whole effort is about. I think um, it is, uh, you know, we had a short, in our intergovernmental process, we had a very short conversation about it. I'm sure we'll come back to it many times. Um, but we haven't, we haven't really operationalized that yet. We haven't talked about what mm -hmm. that needs to be in order to do what every single member state sat, sat there and said, which is to inspire something short and concise that inspires and gives meaning to this whole effort. Um, so we all know that that's where we want to go. But in order to actually make that real, we have to go beyond sort of UN speak. And I think one of the ways that we do that is by highlighting things like innovation and like the possibilities that come from it and the examples that come from it. So I don't know how that conversation is going to play out. But I do think in terms of sort of further engagement for all of us, I know we'll stay I keep touching the microphone. <laughs> we'll stay very engaged, but I think this actually goes for everyone. Um, figuring out very real ways of building innovation and an argument for it into this political declaration and making that argument to all member states and to the co-facilitators and sort of more broadly, I think is um, is a really a very real need right now because um, you know one of the reasons I think that it didn't end up in every in every goal area was because I think people saw it as a transformative enabler. And I think that sounds very, you know, very UN speak, but I do think that <laughs> it is, I'm sorry, I know I've gotten into this world, yeah. but, um, but I think, you know, I think the, those kinds of cross-cutting ideas are supposed to go in the chapeau piece that lays down why, why we're here. Yeah. Um, so I don't think we should lose sight of them. And power it, of that. And it does seem like there, and there are surely others of these enablers, I guess I think of them as some, some guiding operating principles. And, and I, I, you know, it's easy to think of innovation within the context of R&D or innovative financing. It becomes an adjective for lots of things. But, but if it really was transformed into a, a principle, a, 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 a new standard operating procedure of how the world reacts and acts differently, I think mm -hmm. would be a, a terrific step yeah. forward. So, so I, I do want to think a bit about, um, 
how the world does work, particularly yeah, from an R&D perspective. Uh, so I was, when I introduced you, Will, I was describing, you know, for me, one of the big innovations of the last 15 or 20 years <laughs> has been the whole shift of how product development is, is resourced and done. And I'm, you know, and that, it, it may be that that is exactly the right mechanism and we've, 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 we've got it, we just have to keep resourcing it and we'll get all of these new great innovations. But I'm wondering, in the spirit of thinking differently, is the R&D infrastructure, does, does, should the world look differently in, by 2018, 2020, in terms of how we think about R&D and product development um, to prepare for innovation and, and to facilitate and accelerate innovation? I think so. I think there's, there's a couple of things that could really be helpful. I, there, the current structure is really great compared to having no structure. <laughs> so <laughs> that seems quite logical, but at least it means that we've passed a certain sort of basic level. Um, governments like the US government, the European Union, a number, uh, quite a number of actors, uh, new philanthropic foundations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have basically come to the table and said, we need to do things differently, we need to work. And I think we need to continue that process. So one of the most exciting things I see, and I mentioned this before, is so the, the growing leadership that countries like the BRICS are taking nowadays. So mm -hmm. I think that that's an important part. They haven't been traditionally part of these processes. So mm -hmm. this means that you need to have some way of bringing them in. They have a different interest to some extent they have a different focus they are very much burdened by some of the issues that makes it very different for them it's not eight it's actually getting their own citizens treated for a disease that's very different at the same time as i mentioned we need to continue doing what we've been doing and it is bringing groups together um, making sure there are no bubbles of innovation that are very technically astute but very specific <laughs> and that actually don't get to a patient that is I think something that continues uh, mm -hmm. to be a challenge where um, researchers look at a very specific goal to themselves but don't put all the pieces together mm -hmm. to bring it to a patient. So I think that, that sort of patient mindedness and I think in development that, that goes further. So how can someone have a real good chance in life? How do you find that job? Do you know that you're going to be better if you go to the doctor? Sounds simple for many of us, that's not, that's not the question. Will my daughter go to school just like my son? Will they have the same chances in life? And I think that means that instead of talking about processes and mm -hmm. about what, what governments need to do, is sort of change the horizon and say, okay, here's the person, here's the, mm. here's the individual, here's the patient, and then bring that back and say, why are things not happening? I think that's a change that has been going on and that needs to continue going on. Absolutely. You know, there, it, it's, it, as you say that, it's, it's interesting, and, and that's a, a, a huge macro description, but, but even at the individual level, there's so many examples in, in global health R&D mm -hmm. where we think we know what we're doing, um, and, and the products uh, go through a development process and actually are not what exactly. people want. Yeah. Um, and thinking about dosing, thinking about what does a user want, and there is a, 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 a happy, I think, in, in a number of our interactions with various funders and product developers, a real sense of beginning yeah. with the end in mind. Um, at the end of the day, you know, it doesn't help us coming up with another large pill that's, that's uh, not satisfactory for, for yeah. pediatrics. It's not enough to have a product that is biologically effective, but no one wants to use it. Um, we, we have plenty so of those maybe. already. So yeah. this issue of how do we think about uh, engaging potential users of any of these products differently, and, and uh, I know a lot of the, the existing funders are engaged in that. Um, can I oh, just make a good point on that, that um, you know, part of, there is a, a sort of a lot of discussion, particularly you know, with the WHA coming up, <coughs> um, sort of agitation about you know, the, the, the current system of R&D is, is broken and it's not working. Um, and I think it's important to recognise that, um, you know, th the system that we do have in place, particularly with the public-private product development partnerships, um, and you know, that who've implemented this sort of patient-focused approach, uh, has been very successful in delivering quite a robust new pipeline of products that are appropriate for use in developing countries. Mm -hmm. um, um, through you know bringing together public, private, and industry financing, mm -hmm. um, and so, so I think sometimes that gets lost in in the concern, and mm -hmm. so we should we should you know re remember and, and sort of recognise that that we are you know making good progress there. No, absolutely, and I think it's important too when you think about any of these pieces and back to this issue of, of financing at all. Um, it's not just more money. 
Um, I, I, there's a, a number of ways I could imagine getting double and triple the amount of resources we have and still fail miserably. Um, it's a question, and, and there's, a, there's also a, a, a case where we have very limited new resources where we still could have great impact, but a lot of it's what, whether it's within the R&D space, whether it's within health infrastructure, whether it's within global governance uh, or poverty eradication or education, where the spend, and it's the easy thing to say, but spending it way more efficiently and effectively um, actually gets lost sometimes when we have more money than less money. And I'm not at all advocating for less. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but whether we, you know, it should be not just, we need a billion more, but we need this much more to do this piece of work, whether it's within the R&D specific landscape or any of the others. Um, we, we are winding down and we, we've covered the, the, the proverbial waterfront. What I'd love to do just to get to some final thoughts, and I think maybe we'll go in the same order that we started, so I'll, I'll just cue that up so, Jenny, you have a, <laughs> an extra second to think about it. Um, you know, we have uh, folks on the webinar from all over uh, the world, and in fact, we know there'll be people downloading it uh, and listening and watching uh, after the fact. So it would be great to have each of you just give, give a quick sense of, of what do I do now? Um, if I'm an advocate, if I'm uh, 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 working in any of these in, in areas, what do I do now within the next few months as this process kind of begins to wind down in its current phase to what do I do next in the, in the bigger picture? So maybe, Jenna, if you want to start and just each of you take it, you know, help us understand what do I do now? Great. Um, I, you know, I think it's going to be different for different, um, different people, but uh, just to touch on a few uh, constituencies, if you will. You did ask a question about civil society engagement, mm -hmm. and I think um, uh, depending on where you sit within that and, and what sector of society, um, it'll be really valuable to be thinking about what you think needs to happen in your country, what you want to see your government and the other sectors, private um, and public, do um, in your country, um, and be thinking about ways that you can articulate that publicly and the mechanisms you have to hold your government accountable, um, whether it's through the global campaigning effort or through um, specific um, national or local efforts. Um, the other thing is for, for sort of specialists or development practitioners or um, people who are really um, deeply, um, want to be deeply engaged in this process, I think there will still be an opportunity to engage in the and pro feed into the indicator development process. Um, so it's worth knowing and to, to um, continue to watch the website of um, the, the UN's sustainable development website and particularly from the UN statistical division, which will be managing that process. There will be opportunities for folks to, uh, to feed in and engage. And then lastly, um, as, as Willow said, you know, we all own this agenda, but that also means we all have a part to play in implementing it. And so I think it's important for us not just to think about what we're going to do to hold others accountable, but what each and every one of us is going to do um, to make this vision a reality. No, that's great. Nick? Well, yeah, and I'd, I'd like to, so I guess, hone in on a, a, just a, a sort of one particular area of, of potential influence and, you know, what we, the, the picture that Willow uh, said he'd like to see by 2020, um, the sort of having those products ready uh, in the next five years, um, product development is, is a sort of a process that takes a long time. And so the sort of the uh, investments and, and priority setting that needed to go into that had to happen um, some time ago in order for those products to be ready now. So, uh, and to sort of to your point of how will we know we're on track, we need to sort of be able to measure whether those investments and those um, sort of priorities are being set on the way to 2030. So, you know, that's what, to sort of go back to this, this sort of project that we're doing, I mean, we need to include some sort of um, mm. indicator on, you know, probably on investment in global health R&D uh, in the monitoring framework. So, um, I guess to, for people out there to, to engage in the indicator development process and um, to really sort of get behind uh, and, and to, to agitate for that, mm -hmm. um, to support that. And, and, you know, down the track, as, um, you know, as we noted, it's going to be an evolving process. Um, so, so, you know, it doesn't end in, in March 2016. Um, it's, it's going to, you know, to keep pushing um, and to keep promoting your country to... You know. It's not the beginning of the end, it's the end of the beginning. It yes, sounds like indeed. Uh, Genevieve. So I think just speaking uh, first, just from the sort of, from the US government perspective, I think one of the things that I have um, really 
liked about this process is just how much it has been idea driven mm -hmm. and how thus far um, it's we've gotten into the sort of more uh, traditional negotiation phase or we're getting into it but for quite a long time it was about generating and rising up the best ideas we could find and I think there's still space for that so I guess what I would say is to share them <laughs> to come up with ideas and to share them with us because this is not this is not the kind of process where if it comes for, for us, if it comes from the U.S. government, it's better. I think our hope is that we can actually get as much as possible to drive ideas for monitoring and review for implementation and for the political declaration and even for whatever we talk about goals and targets. I think, and, and very much indicators, I think there is each, in each of these phases of the process, if people reach out and give us and elevate mm -hmm. good ideas, I have watched it happen. It will go directly into our statements and into sort of what we try and drive forward. So please do feel free to kind of connect with us. We will make sure that happens. The and there's some people. things on the screen already about how to yeah. connect. Willow. So very simply, I think um, this is an exciting process. We want those sustainable development goals. We want that ambitious agenda for the world. That's the first thing that anyone can basically contribute by basically saying that. Do not get involved in the particulars of a, of a governmental uh, declaration negotiation process. We want this. We want health for all. We want TB to be out of this world by, 20 th by 2030, 2035. That is something you can get to do. If you focus and if you work together, I think the alliance mentality that we have is an important one in that. Don't go too specific. Work together and sort of go behind these big goals. That's, I think, what needs to happen. That's great. Now, those are all terrific and, and all spot on in terms of ideas really driving this and that innovation has to be there. Um, thank you all. I want to just really wrap up with making sure people realize there are plenty of ways to stay involved and we will, can certainly put you in touch with any of the four panelists and their organizations, but also through the Global Health Technology Coalition. Um, there are ways to follow it, of course, because we are in 2015. The big innovation is a hashtag. Um, Use it. Um, there's a way to communicate all over the world with each other, um, not just within the Global Health Technology Coalition, but more broadly. So um, you'll see on the screen ways to do that. There are a number of, of working groups involved and, and ways to connect um, with GHTC and with others. want to be sure people know that um, just as we close, on your screen will be a, an evaluation form that we really do encourage you to fill out so we can figure out what else we all need to be doing to make this a better place. Um, there's also a webinar that uh, GHTC will be hosting on May 18th during the World Health Assembly uh, coming up in just a few weeks. There is an enormous amount to be done by all of us, uh, not just by March 2016, but by 2030. It is a world in which I think w it's safe to say, no, whether you love the targets, whether your favorite thing is missing, it's a world in which we want to inhabit. And uh, I think as so many of you said, it's all of ours. Um, and the, the SDGs will be what they will be. We are responsible uh, as stewards of that to figure out what it is we want to do to make that even close to a reality. Um, I think one thing, Nick, you said very early on um, that I just want to you know, keep coming back to, health remains critical. Um, you don't get to any of those goals without health systems, without healthy individuals, uh, healthy children, healthy adults. Um, and, and that becomes clear. And always balancing this realism and this aspiration. And, and making sure that we, we don't um, let the perfect be the enemy of the good, but that we don't set our eyes a little bit further um, than we think we can actually achieve um, and push each other to it. And at the end of the day, I think most importantly, holding all of us accountable. As an advocate, it is easy to tell funders what to do and tell researchers what to do and tell product implementers what to do um, and hold them accountable. But I think one of the things we always are reminded as advocates is to hold ourselves accountable um, and hold each other accountable. So uh, with that, I want to thank the four of you. Uh, um, thank the Global Health Technology Coalition. Thanking all of you who are part of the webinar and, and hopefully you will all stay in touch and connected. And uh, we will continue this conversation for many uh, days, weeks, and I suspect months and years to come. Thanks very much. <laughs>